Hi, I'm Catherine Moriwaki, Associate Professor of Media Design at Parsons. Hi, everyone. My name is Cassandra Hadil. I am a Settler Scholar, Designer, and Artist, and I also teach a section of CC Lab. In this talk for Critical Computation, I'm going to be working through some of my research and design projects. These projects particularly center around data systems, both technological and cultural, materiality, and normativity. I also want to give a quick trigger warning that this talk briefly mentions subjects of sexual assault. So I want to start with the relationship between the systemic and the cultural. Uh, particularly the assertion that systems of culture and systems of technology are related to each other, both on a literal and metaphorical level. So in 2017, I was fortunate enough to work with amazing scholars in the field of Indigenous studies, and my re major research project at that time was a digital essay project that centered around the work of Indigenous technologists and Indigenous speculative fiction authors. So this project is a lot of things. One of the things that it does is to explore some of the ways that indigenous technologists and authors analyze, critique, and resist settler colonialism by using computation as a metaphor for colonial structures. So in the project, one of the artists that I read about is Jason Edward Lewis, who is interested in exploring and unsettling the relationship between technology and language. Lewis's project, which is called Poem, is rooted in his exploration of how, quote, a wrong racial classification could endanger the fundamental fabric of the dominant society, end quote. So the project engages with how language conceals and reveals through terminology regarding race. And I've highlighted here the last line of one of Lewis's poems, which is called No Choice About the Terminology. And this final line is the only line that doesn't scroll, but it types over and over again, letter by letter, we must remain dead. So the act of remaining dead, Lewis is suggesting, is a continuous process. And it evokes this pretty famous quote from scholar Patrick Wolf, settler colonialism is a structure, not an event. And if we think about what Wolf's quote is actually saying, settler colonialism is distinct from plain old colonialism, because it is a case where the colonizing culture stayed. So when we're talking about settler colonialism, what we're really saying is a continuous occupation of indigenous lands. So that's what the United States is, and Canada, and many other places around the world. So scholar Jean O'Brien draws our attention to the narrative of Indian extinction that settlers tell ourselves in order to remake this occupation here into something that feels inevitable. She writes about the myth that modernity is something non-Indian as a story that the US is constantly reinforcing to itself through a variety of tactics. So here she pulls out pageants, commemorations, monument building, and lecture hall performance. Um, I also want to point out the word cycle here, which is actually very important. So if you grew up in the United States, think about your high school history classes, right? When are the time periods, if any, that you actually learned about indigenous history? Probably in the era that is often called first contact in the 1400s and 1600s. So the beginning of settler history in the United States is also talked about the end of indigenous history. And Jody Bird makes this same point very succinctly. So the story of America depends upon banishing the Indian as part of its denouement. So what Lewis's poem is actually doing is drawing our attention to something that is calling itself an ending, but is actually a loop. So there's a structural and semantic misalignment that he's pointing out here. Death is an ending, but a loop is a cycle. And O'Brien literally calls these colonial narratives a cycle. There are these stories that have to be retold again and again generation by generation in order to reinforce this colonial narrative. So that's what settler colonialism is. It's something that's acting as if it's happened already, it's in the past and it's completed. And that prevents us from investigating the possibility that it could or should actually be stopped or intervened in. And this gets me to the idea of settler colonialism as a black box. So like the modern computer interface, settler colonialism creates the illusion of transparency even as it conceals its own logics of social control. So the colonial state presents itself as default, inevitable, even neutral, but colonization isn't something out there that happened in a distant past or is happening in a faraway place. 
it's right here. It's programmed and hardwired into our societal lives. So the power of what Lewis is doing in this piece is showing this loop in the process of completing itself over and over again. And in using a novel technological form to do so, he is also effectively refuting the myth of non-modernity or extinction, right? Because he's showing here's an indigenous artist using technology to resist and critique colonization. Um, so it works on a lot of different levels. And this is what's kind of at stake in examining these kinds of structural parallels between society and computation for me. Computation is giving us really important language for thinking about these social systems, particularly when we're thinking about digital artists whose work concerns social structures. And at the same time, we need the societal analysis in order to turn the lens back onto computation and think about the ways that systemic oppression are coded into our machines as well as ourselves and our world. So turning the lens back onto computation and specifically onto data, if the key metaphor of my indigenous studies work is society as a black box, then the key metaphor of my work around data would have to be automation. So when something is automated or made modular or reusable in our code, we know it means we're taking one structure and replicating it and making it bigger, big enough to build something out of it. So the idea of a loop again. So this is the Zine Network project, which is ongoing, but this most recent iteration was completed in the spring of 2020. Zine Network is interested in thinking about how we organize, visualize, and navigate library collections and library data. One of the key questions of the project is how data produces normativity among its subjects and what kind of effects that creates in collections that are distinctly queer or decolonial in nature. So the first question we need to ask here is what does data actually do? And I would argue that data describes things. It's a system of describing something or measuring something, right? And specifically library data describes the physical and non-physical attributes of a book as a way of measuring what that book is. And part of the argument of this project is that by describing something, data also actually begins to inscribe the characteristics of that thing onto a broader system. And that's how normativity is created. So I think again of the loop, the idea of starting with one piece of information and looping through an entire set of things in order to perform some consistent action onto all of them. And in this case, I'm thinking of starting with a single book and understanding that book as a way to think of a whole set of books. And this evokes a little bit Chimamanda Adichie's danger of a single story, because I'm really also talking about a single type of book, a book that, for lack of a better term, I call a Eurocentric book object. And what this usually means is a bound volume by a single author that is supposed to be useful and objective. So we know, of course, that not all, not all books are useful and objective. In fact, throughout the history of colonization, the Eurocentric book object has served as a tool for colonization, for social standardization, assimilation in education systems, and control. But again, this is one of those black boxes, the thing that says it's neutral and objective and transparent. Well, in fact, it is not that. So what kind of data are actually associated with this sort of book? Author, title, publication information, physical size, and these things called subject headings. So some other stuff. These fields, however, actually make all sorts of assumptions about what kind of book we're actually talking about. They assume a model of more or less single authorship. They assume that the book will be commercially published. They assume that the book is pretty much a rectangle and has rectangularly measured dimensions. It sounds silly at first to question these sorts of things, but there are lots of collections where these assumptions actually don't apply. So the Barnard Zine Library, with whom I worked on this project, is an example of a non-normative collection by those standards. The Zine Library is a collection of over 5,300 zines with an emphasis on works by queer authors, women and non-binary authors, and authors of co color. The zines in the collection are largely self-published, self-printed, and self-assembled. They stand outside the traditional model of publishing, circulating instead in informal networks of friends, fairs, and art festivals. Most zines do not have a single author. Many zine authors do not use their legal name. Many zines are not bound the way that conventional books are bound. Some, there's only a single copy or a few copies. 
So what actually happens when you have a text like this in your collection that doesn't conform to the conventional idea of what a book is? What is going on in the gaps between what the data is built to describe and the object that you actually have? That's where things start to get really interesting. So here's an example of a really cool text in the Barnard Zine Library. This is Quarrel. Quarrel is subtitled as Stories of Survivor Self-Determination, Direct Action, Strategies for Safer Spaces, and Ripping Patriarchy to Shreds. So if we think about the kind of words, ideas, values, and communities we would associate with this text, just based on what these pages look like, I'm sure some things and some value systems come to mind. And now this is how Quarrel is actually categorized using the Library of Congress's official subject headings. So the key words that we have here are political activists, rape, direct action, and patriarchy. That's one way to describe what this text is, <laughs> but it's definitely a pretty limited way and it takes a pretty conservative position. And this is a typical example of what happens to a text like this when it's categorized in a library system. It gets really pretty flattened. Um, and part of this reflects the bias of the Library of Congress subject headings, which are standardized terms used to classify library holdings throughout much of the world. Uh, they're also notorious for being conservative, heteronormative, and colonial in nature. Um, and in fact, the term for describing queerness according to the system is sexual minorities still. Not queer people or LGBT people or any similarly up-to-date term um, and as scholars point out, heterosexuality is not even marked in this system. So there's no category for talking about straightness. Uh, it's just treated as the default. So that's one part of the problem. The other element is that this system, when you look at the data, very clearly was not designed to hold this kind of material. So this is a small sampling of data taken out of this collection. Um, and what really stands out are all these gaps, right? There's spaces where there's missing author information in the first column, uh, missing publication data, uh, missing date or location data. There are as many gaps as there are actual pieces of information here. So I'd be remiss if I didn't quote digital humanities scholar Marissa Parham, uh, who has this idea of glitch as error that reveals structure. So the gaps become additive by making the gap apparent, you wonder might, what might emerge out of that gap. So Parham is talking about making the breakage of computation into something generative. In this case, it's even simpler than that. It's the breakage of structure. It's not only the literal gaps of the data, but the conceptual gap between what the data is built to describe and what we're actually seeing. So you'll sometimes hear scholars talk about the politics of absence. So I think of Mimi Onuoha's Library of Missing Datasets where she makes theoretical libraries of all the data of things that don't exist. And this is the kind of thing that they're referring to. So the question that this leaves us with, of course, is what do we actually have? So when we're looking at the data, we're confronted with this sort of provocative absence that leads us to compute meaning out of its nothingness. But we also have an entire physical space, an entire zine library filled with zines that actually exist. And those things are present. And so that is the sort of final key question of this project is what does an actually respectful and appropriate classification of queer zines look like? So for this iteration of the project, the answer turned out to be living in the data itself. So Jenna Friedman, who is the zine librarian at Barnard and is also a zine star herself and is active in that community, um, uses a data field called a local note to describe the physical appearance and content of zines with these content rich summaries. And she uses another local note field to apply custom genres to the zines, um, which you see some of here, political zines, DIY zines, fan zines, mama zines, school zines, 24 hour zines, all these things that the Library of Congress data couldn't even comprehend, much less have language for. And so these genres are more or less better than the Library of Congress in every conceivable way for this collection. And because they stem from the form of the zines themselves, they're descriptive in a way that the traditional metadata can't be with this collection because the traditional metadata wasn't designed to hold materials like this. So if we go and actually look at some of the data for a specific zine, this is what we see. We have a beautiful content rich description that Jenna wrote followed by those awful Library of Congress headings, followed by the custom zine genre fields. So the stark contrast 
is telling a really compelling story about the contradictions of this classification. The visualization that I have built for this project follows the knowledge organization system that is suggested by Jenna's zine genres and Basically, it takes these genres and attempts to spatialize them. And I take seriously the call of folks in library and information sciences, including scholar Emily Drabinsky, who writes that when dealing with problematic data, we should steer clear of co correction of problematic headings or terminology, um, and instead invite the user to grapple with this. Uh, and she suggests that designing interfaces that make related and broader terms visible to users so that they can understand how materials are linked is one of the ways to reveal points in the classification structure through which the power may leak out. Drabinsky's approach of invitation and showing, rather than merely correcting, is at the heart of this project. Visualizations, after our, all, are our attempts to show. When we apply an organizational system to a set of things, we are creating a landscape, a geography that tells us something about how to read the information. And that begs the question, what are the features of the geographies that we're actually making? So if we map out these systems with all of these biases and oppressions and normativities, what do those systems actually look like? And how can we make maps that will navigate the fraught landscape that has been created in many cases long before we actually got here? So in the main zine network visualization, the zine genres shape the broad geography of the collection with these colorful neighborhoods. And upon a closer look, the boundaries are fluid as most zines in the collection claim more than one category. The visual landscape that is created by zine genres embraces the multiplicity and overlap of its inhabitants categories. So this is just one data visualization of a collection that really could be visualized in endless ways. Uh, depending on which aspects of the data you choose to focus on and how you are thinking of organizing them. And all interfaces are data visualizations, right? That's also something that's important to acknowledge. They don't always say that they're data visualizations, but they all are at some level. So this visualization focuses on presence over absence. Uh, and that's something that's largely made possible by Jenna's careful and thorough classification of the collection. It does not attempt to correct or redeem the Library of Congress's language, nor does it remove it entirely. Rather, it takes it out of the visual organizational system of the collection. So the Library of Congress data appears in the metadata of each zine, but it is not part of the structure that builds the overall visual of the interface. So what this visualization gets us is the ability to see these materials relationally, and it restores some of that spatial feeling of browsing in the stacks or browsing in the zine test fest tent. And it gets us, hopefully, a step to closer to thinking critically about library data and about data systems more broadly. Thank you for that presentation, Cassandra. It was really fascinating. And I, I think as I was watching you present your work, uh, you know, I, I was struck by a number of things, but one of them was, you know, in, in connection with the um, earlier work you presented in your talk, this idea of territories and mapping territories, right? Uh, your, your project that you were talking about uh, looks at metadata and uh, especially sort of the reductive nature of the kinds of categorizations that are constructed through um, sort of like forcing, you know, rich material into, into the confines of, of the structure that metadata requires. But at the same time, the visualization that you've put together uh, is, is one which is actually complex, blended, and, you know, you could argue actually uh, illustrates a variety of different potential viewpoints. So I, I guess what I'm thinking about in terms of this project is um, what are, what would you see as the implications for uh, design at large in developing this project? And uh, in terms of the kinds of classification systems that currently exist, which are being ported over into, uh, you know, computational and electronic systems. What are ways in which we might be able to uh, complicate the narratives and the territory around uh, those systems as well? Yeah, there's a lot there, and it's a really good question. 
Um, there's a couple of elements of this project that I see as significant for design and for data systems as a whole in slightly different ways. Um, one of those implications is the idea of alternate taxonomies and alternate organization systems, which is one of the things that this project gets at um, that I'm actually hoping to explore more fully in the future. Um, and that is the idea of, okay, we have a taxonomy and a system of organization that has been created by the data that currently exists. But there's 10 billion other ways that we could organize these zines, right? We could organize them by the length that it took to make them. We could organize them by the total number of copies that were produced. We could organize them by the social network that they traveled through in order to actually get to the zine library to get to Jenna's hands, right? Um, we could organize them by color, by size, by construction, right? Some of them are stapled, some of them are stitched. There's all these other ways of thinking about what information is significant in measuring what this object is. And that comes with a lot of ideas about value systems, right? So I talked about commercial publishing and that actually interestingly is very tied to colonization because it is the idea that knowledge is held property and books and published information is held property that is copyrighted and protected under the rights of a single person, which is not a value system that actually describes a lot of material that exists in the world. So breaking away from particular systems like that and considering what are the alternative systems that actually make the most sense for this type of collection. And it's interesting to, to think about the richness, richness of the material too, because part of what I eventually had to come to grips with is that there's always a loss with this type of visualization and classification in general, because at the end of the day, you have to choose something, right? You have to choose one aspect or two aspects that you're sort of using to organize the system, to organize the visual layout, to organize all of these different things. Um, so you're always going to emphasize something over something else. And then the tricky thing becomes emphasizing something that is actually meaningful to the material and that showcases it in the value system that it is most appropriate to do so with. And then the other big thing I think that I heard you say was the translation of these sorts of systems into the digital. Right, so that is very significant for this project because library metadata is one of the oldest data systems that we have that we consider part of contemporary computation. And it's actually changed astonishingly little from its analog form. So the type of data that all of the library data that I showed today comes in is it's in MARC format, which is machine readable cataloging is what that stands for. And it is, it inherits its structure from punch cards. That's where it comes from. Um, and there's been some shift towards what's called linked open data instead, which is a little bit more relational and dynamic and what we would expect to see with this type of thing. But yeah, and then if you go back even further, the sheer like colonial nature of library structures and how they hold information and, and have actually very undemocratic principles at their heart of sort of collecting information about other people and making that information available to a select elite, that's also not such a great legacy, right? Um, and so I think there are all sorts of ways that these systems have been just sort of ported into the digital without a huge amount of sort of introspection or reflection on some things that might want to adapt in light of the way that we think about libraries hopefully is something different now. And the Library of Congress subject headings are the reflection of the worst of that sort of unintrospective porting. I have another question actually, which centers around how you personally uh, grapple within with working with tools and technologies, which kind of represent a fantasy of total visibility. Right. So your, you know, your, your background is, is in this kind of uh, colonial studies work. And 
you know, I, I think one of the arguments there really is this Western rational viewpoint, which purports that everything can be seen, everything can be laid out, everything can be classified and ordered. And so, you know, this you're, you're engaged in this process of mapping. Granted, it's an alternative mapping, but it's still utilizing technologies that have this history and baggage. And then as you were saying, there are so many different uh, characteristics of these zines that you could have emphasized and used for categorization. But some of those characteristics are actually really hard to automate in terms of data collection, right? And yet underpinning most of these kinds of cataloging systems and databases is this fantasy of being able to have infinite amounts of data which provides a kind of uh, orderly and unobstructed view of the information and then this belief that we're going to be able to um, glean new insights from being able to manipulate that data through a variety of different ways which you know to a certain extent there are some new insights that can be derived from ordering data in um, unexpected or unusual ways that might come out of having information recorded but you know, I was just kind of thinking about oh, some of the some of the things that you were describing um, about you know the pathways the zines took and uh, you know total number of of copies published. I mean, this is information that's not going to be really easily collected even within the collections that you were working with because the structure just doesn't work that way. So how did you grapple with that? Yes, <laughs> the short answer to your question is just yes, and in a way that question is sort of the point. Right. Um, and this this goes back also to the indigenous study stuff, actually, um, and thinking about what the politics of a map actually are. Right. Which is to render space visible from above, as it were. Right. To render someone else's usually someone else's space visible and accessible to this other force, this other entity, I think this goes back to the politics of absence question, right? And that's, it's part of why I find Parham's work and Mimi Onuaha's uh, library of missing data sets work really compelling because they point out that there is sometimes a point to that absence. And it's not so much that it is absence as it is something that should not be publicly privileged to see. There's actually an archiving tool called Mercadu, which is used specifically for indigenous um, collections of material. And one of the features of that archiving software is that it is not open to the public. The collections that it holds, there are certain objects that it has to be agreed upon. Okay, like it's okay for everyone to see this. There are other objects in the collection that there are only select people that should be able to view those objects. And they are organized within that technological system in a way such that it maintains that element of privacy, of, of not being made legible to just anyone. Um, so I think thinking about that is very critical, but you're right that ultimately a mapping schema is an approach that reveals elements of these materials where one of the key advantages is that they're fugitive. One of the key advantages of zines is that in certain circles, if you're talking about very sort of anarchist or anti-capitalist or queer materials, they need to not be traced and tracked. I chose the Barnard Zine Library's collection very specifically because it's already out there. And I did not want to take a collection that maybe, and it, and it exists there voluntarily, right? So most of the zines that Jenna catalogs there, people send to her and say, hey, I made this thing do you want it for the collection? Um, and there is sort of a consentful relationship around that collection. Um, that's not always the case with these sorts of things. And so the choice to look at a collection that was already available on the internet and that I was confident I wouldn't be revealing something that wasn't meant to be cataloged and revealed in this way was important to me. So it's tricky. There isn't really an answer to it. Sometimes I would say, for examples like the um, the one that you mentioned about sort of struggling to trace the origins of a zine, for example, sometimes that that struggle and reckoning with the difficulty a of collecting data in that way, and b the difficulty of rendering it using a digital tool is part of the point. Uh, for example, I worked on a project where we were making maps um, of indigenous space during King Philip's War and using 
mapping technologies that really were not prepared or capable of rendering territories that did not have very fixed linear boundaries. And so running up into that problem was part became part of the message of the project is that these technologies are very limited in the point of view that they are able to take about certain things like this. And so tracking how difficult it might be to actually trace the like genealogy of a zine's um, journey to get to a particular place might be something that actually leads to fruitful design findings. So thank you so much, Cassandra, for your talk. This was really interesting and we uh, appreciate it greatly. And um, I encourage all of you to go and follow Cassandra's links to learn more about her work. Thank you for having me.